warm welcome to Christchurch Thornton. A, a special welcome to any watching on our live stream. So uh, welcome to you at home, those who can't get to church. We understand and it's a pleasure to have you um, participating from home. And a warm welcome to anybody who might be here for the first time or a returning time after a little while. You're the most welcome. And we do hope if you can, do stay on afterwards and come through to the community centre hall for a drink of tea or coffee and hopefully some good conversation. And our regular congregation, please do, look out, please do look out for any who might be here for the first time so we can warmly welcome them. That'd be a lovely thing to do. We are a family of Christians. We are brothers and sisters. And as we meet today in safety and freedom, we recognize that across the world, there are many Christians who can't do so. In some countries, that's because they're persecuted, where faith is not tolerated, and so they meet underground. In some countries, it's simply because it's not safe because of the bombs coming into their towns and villages. So let's bow our heads in prayer and be still and come before a God who is a refuge, a fortress and a strong tower, seeking his help and his strength and his comfort. Almighty God, we thank you for the world you have created. And we recognise that throughout this world, humanity has made a mess. Almighty God, this morning we're concerned about the safety of so many people across the world. We're concerned about those who have no food, to the point where they have to sell items, or even people, or even bodily organs to survive conscious of our brothers and sisters who face persecution, arrest and even murder just for proclaiming the name of Jesus. And this morning we recognize the plight of the Ukrainian people, seeking you to help them, to guide them into safety, to deliver them from danger and to bring peace. Lord Jesus Christ, Prince of Peace, please reign in this world Please give discernment to world leaders as they make difficult decisions. For any right now who are frightened and scared and hiding and have no one to help, in your mercy, please provide someone to deliver them from danger and to provide for their needs. Lord God, we trust in you. We know you're good. And so we commit the people of Ukraine and the surrounding regions into your hands. Pray for your blessing upon them and that you will be their helper. And for ourselves here this morning, help us not to take for granted our freedom, but to have joy in our hearts as we worship the living God, and to sense your spirit in us, working, showing us our own lives and how we can change to glorify you. Almighty God, may your presence be here with us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the first Sunday in Lent in the Gospel reading from Luke. Before Jesus begins his public ministry, he is led by the Spirit into the desert where he faces a cosmic battle with Satan. And we shall learn more of this battle today and what Jesus' victory means for us when we face temptation. The words on the screen in yellow are what I say and the words in white will say all together. As Jesus began his work for the world... He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. As we begin our Lenten journey, may we be empowered by the Spirit, even in the uncomfortable places. In those 40 days, Jesus was faced with hunger, doubt, and temptation. As we seek to follow Jesus, may we be strengthened by the Spirit to do what is right when we face difficult choices. Jesus left the wilderness, faithful and obedient to God, rejoicing in the one in whom he trusted. As we continue on our path to faithfulness, may we be led by Jesus Christ, rejoicing in the Lord our God. Amen. We trust in our God, who is strong, who no matter what the world sends our way, or Satan himself, the world's tempestuous sea, God will guard us, guide us, keep us and feed us. Let's stand to sing our opening hymn, Lead Us, Heavenly Father, Lead Us.
be seated as we come before God, mindful of his pardon. We believe in a God who sent his one and only beloved son to live the life we struggle to live and to die the death we deserve to die. And Jesus, through his death on the cross, has made us one with God and with the sure and certain hope in our hearts of access to the heavenly kingdom where we'll dwell with God Almighty for an eternity. So let's now come before God and confess our sin. In the quietness, just take a moment now to bring to mind and to allow God to bring to mind the areas of your life where you've fallen short of God's glorious standards. Gracious and merciful God, we confess to you our reluctance to get involved in difficult situations and for the times when we are tempted to do what is easy rather than what is right. Forgive us, O oh God, and increase our trust in you. When we are tempted to use our gifts, use the gifts you give us to benefit ourselves at the expense of serving others, forgive us, O oh God, and increase our trust in you. When we are tempted to boast, rather than being guided by the humility of Christ, forgive us, O oh God, and increase our trust in you. When we are tempted to use power to influence and control others, forgive us, O oh God, and increase our trust in you. Merciful God, save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. Forgive us our sins and fill us with the joy and peace of your salvation. So strengthen us with your spirit during this Lenten season that we put our whole trust in you as confidently as Jesus did. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As the Apostle Paul wrote, if you confess with your lips that Jesus Christ is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These words contain the good news that is in Jesus Christ, that we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Libby's now going to read to us. If you're following in our Black Church Bible, please turn to page 859. The Temptations of Jesus. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil, and ate nothing during those days. And when they were over, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command the stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man does not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will, be all, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You should not put the Lord God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Thank you, Libby. We bow our heads in prayer for today's collect, our special prayer for today. Almighty God, whose son, Jesus Christ, fasted 40 days in the wilderness and was tempted as we are, 
yet without sin. Give us grace to discipline ourselves in obedience to your spirit. And as you know our weakness, so may we know your power to save. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So please do um, have your Bibles open, if you have one in front of you, to page 859. And we're also going to be going to page 2 at some point. So you can put a finger in 859 at some point and put one in page 2. Yeah, I've got ten of them, so you should be okay. <laughs> Opportunist. I want to say today that the devil, or Satan, as we sometimes call him, is the best opportunist. Now we know what an opportunist does. He or she might be just walking around the neighborhood, and when they see something that they could perhaps take, it might be a bicycle, it might be a car door that's not locked, they can open it up and take something, they take something from somebody else. They might not have gone out with a particular plan to take a specific thing, but they're just looking for an opportunity to devour, to take something that's not theirs. And I want to say today that the devil is such a person, a being. He is an opportunist. He wants to spring into action when the right time comes. Look at the very last verse of his passage today, verse 13. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time because he was going to return again probably at the garden of Gethsemane the devil was just waiting for a better time another opportunity to come and strike let's think though about the opportunity that presented itself to him in the wilderness let's first of all establish why Jesus was in the wilderness look at me at verse 1 of chapter 4 and let's see why did he end up there it wasn't because of Satan. It wasn't an accident. Listen carefully. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from a Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. So it was God the Spirit who sent him, who led him into the wilderness. It was no accident. And it was not the devil who, who brought him to the wilderness. It was on purpose. He, Jesus, went and endured temptation so that we today remember that Jesus has done what we could never do and we see that for 40 days he was in that wilderness now I'd often thought that perhaps the devil tempted him during those 40 days you know perhaps after day two when Jesus is getting hungry perhaps then his first temptation came perhaps you know a fortnight later the second temptation came but no if you look with me at the end of verse 2 I'll read verse 2. For 40 days, being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days, and when they were over, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. I hope you can see there that the first temptation came after the 40 days. In other words, when Jesus was very, very hungry. I hope none of you have had to go that long without food. He'd have had water. But he hadn't had any food. 40 days of no food. What would he have given for just a, a crumb or a slice or a, a loaf of bread of some kind? And so Satan, being crafty, knew exactly what to do. Attack Jesus at his most vulnerable point. He's hungry, he's tired, he's isolated. Perhaps he would give in to Satan with those three circumstances in mind. And so he's both an opportunist and a crafty old thing. I say old thing because look now, at, keep, your, keep your finger there, but look at page two of our Bible to Genesis chapter three. Let's remember when we first introduced to this person of the devil in the form of a, a beast, in the form of a serpent. Genesis chapter three, verse one on page two. He says, now a serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. The serpent was more crafty. 
So I've said two things so far. He's an opportunist, opportun opportunist and he's crafty. Let's look at how crafty he is. Look at the, the next line in that first verse. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? You see, his question has in it a lie. Because God didn't say you can't eat of any tree. He just specified one tree that couldn't be eaten from. So he's showing his craftiness in the very question he asks. He causes confusion. He's a trickster. He's a deceiver. He's a liar. And we know what happened next. The woman and the man ate of the tree that they shouldn't have eaten from. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the first sin entered humanity. And so back to our passage now in Luke chapter 4, page 859. The devil is crafty. He's an opportunist. He wants to find us when we're at our most vulnerable to strike. Let's see now what Jesus teaches us about how to deal with the temptation of the devil. So Jesus is hungry. And the devil said in verse 3, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. Very clever, isn't it? If Jesus is hungry, command these stones become bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Well, where is it written? It's written, of course, in the Holy Scriptures, in the Old Testament. So Jesus answers Satan's temptation with the words of God himself with the words of scripture. I want you to really appreciate that fact because we're going to see it happens again and again. The devil now in verse five tries again, he doesn't give up. And that tells us something about his character. He keeps pressing, keeps pushing, keeps persevering, doesn't walk off after the first temptation, but comes back again and again, looking for a, a different vulnerability to prey upon. So in verse 5 we see the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, to you I will give all this authority and their glory for it has been delivered to me and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. So the devil shows Jesus the whole of the universe and says, hey, it can be yours. Just fall down and worship me. Well, imagine if he'd done that. Imagine if God the Son had worshipped the devil. How could we possibly have anything to praise him for now if he had done? He would not be pure, good, perfect, without sin. He'd be sinful and not sinless. He therefore could not have died for our sins as an innocent Lamb of God. It would have messed up the whole of our salvation. We'd have nothing to have hope in. We would not be destined for heaven. Because Jesus would not be king. But the devil would be king, having God worship him. So the consequences would have been disastrous. But look at the lie in what the devil says. The devil implies that the world and the kingdoms of the world are already his. The devil implies that he has all authority and therefore his glory and that he can give it out to whom he wills. But of course, that's not true. Because Jesus is the creator of the world, the sustainer of the world, and he's the king of kings and lord of lords and he's in charge. And so it's not the devil's to give out to begin with. It already belongs to God. But Jesus responds in verse 8, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, your God, and him only shall you serve. So for a second time, he quotes from the scriptures. The scriptures are his defense, are his weapon, are his way to deter the enemy from getting any closer. Verse 9, the devil doesn't give in, but tries again. He took him to Jerusalem. And set Jesus on the pinnacle of a temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. Now notice this question, if. He said it the first time round, if you are the son of God, command these stones become bread. Now he says, um, if you are the son of God, 
uh, throw yourself down. In the, in the statement that the devil makes, he's casting doubt. He's asking Jesus to prove to him that he really is God, if you are the son of God. He's, he's casting doubt there. That's another tactic of Satan, to cause doubt and confusion about who God is. But look at how crafty he is on his third time. Remember so far, each time Jesus has been tempted, Jesus has answered with scripture. And now look what Satan does. In verse 10, Satan says, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. So Satan is now using holy scripture. That's how crafty and clever he is. He takes the, the weaponry, the armor, the defense of Jesus and starts to use it to attack Jesus. Because he misquotes it and uses it out of context. That's another danger we can all have. And uses scripture against God himself to tempt him. But Jesus in verse 90, verse 12, answered, It is said, which is like saying, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Now for any who are new to using our Bibles, if you look before that word you shall not put, there's this very, very tiny letter G. You've got to have very good eyesight. At the bottom you'll find that letter G in the footnotes and it tells us D-U-E-T, meaning Deuteronomy. Meaning Deuteronomy, book of the Old Testament, chapter 6, verse 16. You can go there at some point during the week and see that's where Jesus is quoting from. And with each of these quotations that Jesus says from Scripture, you can see there's a small, num a small um, letter in front of it. That's just to help you understand that that's when the proof is that you can go to on your own and find, oh yeah, this is where it actually was written in the Holy Scriptures. So three times Jesus was tempted, three times Jesus resisted, three times he used the Holy Scriptures as his way, his tool, to cast away Satan from the temptation. So the question is, should we follow suit? Should we do the same when Satan tempts us to despair? Of course, the answer is yes. The best way for you to resist temptation is not willpower. It's not just support from other people around you, human support. It's using the powerful word of God. That's not to say that by that I mean when you're tempted to eat more chocolate than you should, get your Bible out. That's not quite how it works. You can't wave this around in front of a Cadbury's Dairy Milk chocolate bar. It won't stop it. You'll probably put the Bible down and eat the chocolate. So what do I mean when I say use the Word of God? I mean be familiar with the Word of God. The daily reading of Scripture familiarization with who God is through the knowledge of what his word says puts us in good stead that when Satan in his craftiness asks a question that casts doubt in our mind we know what's true and what's false because like Adam and Eve he'll ask a question in such a way he'll frame a question in a way that sounds as though it's right but we can't quite put our finger on why it's not right so we need to know what's counterfeit and what's not. I might have told you this story before, but I was told once that when the people who deal with false currency train how to spot a false £10 note, they often don't study the false £10 note, but the real one. Because when they study the real £10 note and become familiar with its texture and its thickness and its colours, the more familiar they become, the easier it is to spot the fake. So it's the same way with us. The more we study who God is, the more familiar we are with who God is, the Father, Son, and Spirit, the easier it will be to spot the fake. That when Satan tempts us with a, a thought in our mind or a feeling in our heart, we'll be able to know or not if it's really Satan or our own minds or from God himself. We need to be able to spot the fake from the truth. And remember what it is that Satan really wants you to do. He doesn't want you to eat more chocolate. That's not his plan. It's not about your diet, it's not about your exercise regime. 
None of that came up in this passage about temptation. It was all to do with who God is and what God does and what God will do. See, he asked that question, if you are a son of God. His attack was at the character and the person, the divinity of who Jesus was. He wanted Jesus to fall down and worship him. He wanted to dethrone Jesus off his kingship throne and be worshipped himself. He wanted to trick Jesus into falling down, throwing himself off the temple. The devil wants power over your life. The devil doesn't want you to believe in Jesus. The devil doesn't want you to believe that when you die you'll go to heaven. He wants you to doubt that. The devil doesn't want you to believe that your sin can be forgiven. He wants you to think it can't be because you're too bad and nobody could forgive you and even God couldn't forgive you. God wants you to believe that the bitterness you hold about somebody else cannot ever be removed. That's what Satan wants you to believe. But God wants you to know that it can be removed by his power and his strength. Satan wants to cast doubt in all the things we believe about who God is. God wants us to know the truth about God. So when you have those thoughts in your mind about, does God really love me? Am I really forgiven? Will I really go to heaven? Can I really forgive this person? Can I really love God anymore? Those are the kind of doubts that Satan wants to put in our head. And the way to resist thinking along those sorts of lines is to come back to the word of God, to the scriptures, and to quote out loud or to ourselves the truths that we have within this powerful book about who God is. Because that's the only thing that will defeat Satan in terms of his temptation. Now we will fail. We will sometimes believe his lies. We will sometimes fall into his traps because he's crafty and he's an opportunist. Probably cleverer than you and I. But when that happens, we come to the cross afresh. We come to Jesus. We say, Jesus, forgive me. I couldn't resist what you did. But I'm grateful, Jesus, that you do forgive me for not resisting temptation. So don't stay too down in the, in the sort of depths of despair for too long when you are tempted and you do give in. Be quick to come to Jesus and seek his forgiveness. And when you are tempted to believe lies about God, come back to the scriptures and remember Satan is crafty, he's an opportunist. And when you're most vulnerable, when you're feeling down, spiritually dry and thirsty, that's when he'll come and attack you. So try and put things in place to make sure you don't ever get to that place. But lastly, here's something to remember. When Jesus died on that cross for our sins, he died as a perfect human being. It's so important that he was tempted and resisted because that's credited to us. We are clothed, the Bible says, with the righteousness of Christ. That's the right living of Christ. So the temptation that Jesus endured and resisted, it's as though we've endured and resisted that temptation. And the sin that we have committed, the temptation we've given into, is on Jesus. He's clothed in it. And it's as if he has lived our sinful life and we call that that great exchange that great transaction that all of our sin is put upon Jesus and all of his perfect law keeping life is credited to us and we see that here today this was your wilderness these were your temptations and Jesus was victorious over them for you and for me let's bow our heads in prayer Lord Jesus sometimes we walk through the wilderness sometimes we find ourselves vulnerable spiritually we find ourselves feeling far away from you and then we find satan tempting us almighty god clothe us in the armor of god that we might have all the equipment within us to withstand the schemes of a devil help us to stand firm in faith to resist the devil and may we be quick to remember the truth of your words every time the crafty serpent wants to cast doubt in our minds. So protect us, we pray. And Lord Jesus, thank you 
Thank you, thank you so much that you resisted Satan and were able to die as the perfect, sinless saviour for all of our wrongdoing. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let's stand to sing and respond with this worship song, Blessed Be Your Name. we bless your name almighty God we bless you that you're perfect you're good you're true you're living and Lord Jesus you're the only way to the Father you're the way the truth and the life Holy Spirit we praise you that you're living in us Father we thank you for your tremendous love for us Thank you that you said and spoke to your son just before in the wilderness. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. Thank you, Father, for your pleasing son that you sent. To do the things that we couldn't do. To keep the law. And to forgive the things that we get wrong. We want to say today that we believe in you, Father. We believe in you, Son. We believe in you, Holy Spirit. Increase our faith this week, we pray. Amen. Amen. We remain standing to declare our faith. Using words from Philippians chapter 2, let us affirm our faith. 
in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Though he was divine, he did not cling to equality with God, but made himself nothing. Taking the form of a slave, he was born in human likeness. He humbled himself and was obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has raised him on high and given him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every voice proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Please be seated as Gwen now comes to lead us in prayer. Let's pray. <clears throat> Knowing that our Heavenly Father hears us, and we pray especially for our world and the situation in the Ukraine. Psalm 31 verses 21, 22 and 24 says, Blessed be the Lord, for he has wondrously shown his steadfast love to me when I was in a besieged city. I said in my alarm, I am cut off from your sight, but you heard the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cried to you for help. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord. I just thought that was helpful for Ukraine as they're in a besieged city and looking for God to help them. So Heavenly Father, we pray for the Ukraine and an end to the war. We pray for peace talks that will end the conflict. And we ask for your mercy on the Ukrainian people. Help them to be able to leave and find safe places to live. Help us to help those who are displaced, giving aid to them. Encourage all the European nations to be generous in their help for them. And we thank you for our church and for those who minister here. We pray for all the activities of the church each week and pray for more people to come and find friendship and fellowship. May each person who enters here meet Jesus. We pray for the food bank and the generous giving of so many people, and we pray that the food that we give would meet the needs of those who are hungry. We also pray for those who are sad due to bereavement. We ask that you will send people to help them, especially when they're feeling lonely. We pray for the Pilkington family at this time and Fran's funeral on Tuesday. We also pray for the family and friends of Mr. Graham Woods and Mrs. Emily Bullock, who died this last week. And we pray that you will comfort them and that they might know the presence and peace of Jesus in their lives. And as we enter this time of Lent, help us to hear again the determination of Jesus as he faced the cross, and yet he still continued towards it, yet knowing he would die. Help us to put Jesus first in our lives and to live for him. Heavenly Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Gwen. Well, we come here today mindful that we are people who God forgives. And in a moment, we're going to be sharing Holy Communion, coming to the Lord's table to remember the death of Jesus. And the phrase that we often use is that we're justified. That means we're made right with God through our faith in the death of Jesus for our sin. And what that means is that we're all God's children, forgiven children of God as Christians, and that makes us brothers and sisters. We're, we're joint heirs with Christ. We're going to be in the heavenly kingdom together. We're stuck with each other forever, in other words. And that means we're at peace with God. So we're going in a moment to share the peace of God now, for two years, we haven't shook hands. I'm not going to surprise you by saying we're going to today because you're not prepared for that. But in the weeks to come, I think I might suggest to us that we might start doing that again if we feel comfortable. Because we, will, we do have hand gel, of course, before we go up for communion. So perhaps not today, but in the weeks to come, I will be encouraging that. And maybe you'll have to find out a way you can signal to the person that's going to come up towards you who don't want to shake hands. You know, put your hands in your pockets quickly. and Just put your elbow out or something like that. But I think at some point we've got to get back to that human physical touch when we feel safe to do so. So for now, we'll, we'll smile and nod and wink and touch elbows and rub hips, whatever might be appropriate. <laughs> Not too much of that, I hope. <laughs> Let's stand together. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us access to his grace. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. We offer a sign of peace to those around us and peace to those at home. May God be with you. 
In his hour of temptation, when Jesus hungered, he quoted his father's words to Israel in the wilderness. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Lord, we thank you that you have provided all we need. All that we have is yours. Receive the offering of our hands and the gratitude of our hearts. In the name of our Saviour we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love, you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ, you shared our life, that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of a new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. With your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Just as Jesus taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ which he gave for you, and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Lord God, you have renewed us with the living bread from heaven. By it, you nourish our faith, increase our hope, and strengthen our love. Teach us always to hunger for him who is the true and living bread, and enable us to live by every word that proceeds from out of your mouth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, our final hymn reminds us that when Satan tempts us to despair and tells us of the guilt within, upward we look and see him there who made an end of all my sins. And we look at the cross, we remember all that Jesus did for us when Satan tempts us. And that reminds us of the victory over sin, death and evil that Jesus secured for us. Let's stand to sing our final hymn before and in front of God above.
words that Christ has poured on us his glorious love well do please if you can stay for tea and coffee and conversation in the hall there's tea and coffee and biscuits Um, and also if anybody hasn't booked but wish they had done we can squeeze a few more people in for our Sunday lunch we're having a a roast dinner at one o'clock today Um, I'm not trying to tempt you by the way okay that wouldn't be appropriate after today's uh, message but there is beautiful a roast dinner, um, soup roast dinner, cream cakes, cheese and biscuits, tea and coffee. So if you've not got plans for lunch and you'd like to, you can't all stay for lunch, but we've got about 30 booked in, but we can feed more than that. So uh, do let me know if you'd like to stay and I can, I can, I can check we've got enough places left still. That's £10, um, but it's mainly about the fellowship. That's all it's about. It's about having fellowship together, having lunch together. So that's at one o'clock. Lastly, on Tuesday, it's the funeral of our sister in Christ, Anne Pilkington. That's at 1.30 here in church, followed by a reception through into the community centre hall afterwards while the family go for, to the crematorium. So you're, you're most welcome. We'd love to have lots of people there who have known and loved Anne to come and remember her and to thank God for her. So that's Tuesday, the 8th of March at 1.30 here in church. Christ give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, Take up your cross and follow him. And the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.